Okay, Producer Cooper, this episode is your episode. So please tell us, what did you think of Aesop Fables? Okay, and uh, what was your favorite one? I don't know if you should be grabbing the microphone like that, but hey, you're the producer. So uh, any thoughts on the moral lessons you learned from Aesop Fables? No, you don't listen to it. <laughs> you don't listen to a microphone, Cooper. You talk into it. Come on, you're the producer around here. Yeah. Well, thank you for being on today's episode. Any last thoughts? All right. Well, at that note, let's get on with the show. Welcome back to my seminary life. I'm your host, Brandon Knight. And after that lovely little introduction from producer Cooper, I don't know how I could even begin to go any further on the topic of Aesop Fables, but I'm going to go ahead and try and give you at least a little bit of my own thoughts on the subject as well. But again, what more could you ask for? That was the most insightful and also the most concise introduction to the conversation of Aesop Fables, probably in podcast history. I don't know. He's the best producer. What can I say? But hey, for those of you joining us for the very first time, right now, uh, My Seminary Life is in the midst of a series called Ancient Greece. And in each episode, we're taking the time to look at topically how ancient Greece affected the context of the New Testament and our current context as well. Talked about a lot of different areas, philosophy, mythology, our obsession with Sparta. Right now we're in a little two-parter here on the show. Last week we had Christian humanist Joe Skibby here to talk about classical literature, humanism, and And the Iliad and the Odyssey talking about how uh, humanism is not like equal to being an atheist and better understanding what it means to be a humanist and how being a Christian humanist directly affects us as well. Or what how being a Christian affects being a humanist. Uh, Classical literature, having a better understanding of like the time frame of what exactly is classical literature and what falls over the falls under the category of classical and what falls in the category of humanities. And then better understanding why us as why we as Christians, whether we're humanists or not, should take the time to look at and read uh, the Iliad and the Odyssey specifically. Today we're in a little bit of a part two situation when it comes to Greek literature as we begin talking about Aesop fables. Now it's been brought to my attention from a recent conversation that not everybody knows what Aesop fables are. I thought that was something that everybody was generally familiar with, but Uh, There is for sure one story you would be very familiar with, even if you're unsure what this whole Aesop fable thing is. So for a little bit of context, Aesop, much like Homer, much like Socrates, is an ancient Greek 
person who, well, we know some things about, but it's all very, like, we know very little to the point where it is possible that this wasn't really a person, but rather, like, various people put together throughout time. Uh, But from what little we know about Aesop actually comes from a play, a story that was written about a man named Aesop is that he was a slave who collected and wrote short stories that all contain morals at the end of the stories. That's generally what we talk about when we're talking about Aesop fables. These are short stories that have a moral at the end of them. They're morality plays in a way, but very short. And by very short, I mean incredibly short. You know, sometimes when you think short story, you think like what? Maybe a 10 to 12 page Turner, maybe a a short novella with a few chapters. With Aesop fables, we're talking like a paragraph, three paragraphs at the most. These are incredibly short stories that all have morals at the end of them. These aren't just like stories for the sake of stories to be told around the campfire, but these are, they're teaching a lesson. And because of that, Aesop fables have continued throughout the generations to be a teaching tool for children. Uh, This is why producer Cooper was involved in this episode and in this project. Literally, he was very much involved in this because, um, you know, as new parents, producer Cooper is our first child after all, uh, we have been going through the process of getting books for him, right? Whether it was at his birth and people buying him a whole bunch of books or as, you know, the years go on, we try to, we want to encourage him to read. And actually he has already gotten to a place where obviously he cannot read, but sometimes during the day when he is playing, he'll pull, he's got his, I've got his hard, his hard books, uh, in the living room so he can have access to them. He'll pull a whole bunch of them out, sit on the floor and like turn pages. He even knows what direction the book should be. He can tell from the pictures, like what is right side up and he'll sit and he'll turn or he'll pick one up and bring it to me and I'll sit there and read him a book during the day. Uh, My wife, Claire, she does bedtime routine and she reads books to him every night before bed. And, Looking over the books, you know, you want to make sure with a child that you have all the literary classics for a child, right? The Very Hungry Caterpillar, Cat in the Hat, a thousand other Dr. Seuss books. You know, these like, where the wild things are. You know, you want these type of like all-time classics. And looking over his books, I was going through it one day, going through his books one day, uh, just kind of sorting through everything. I realized that he did not have any Aesop fables. And like I said, there's at least one of these short stories that everybody is familiar with, and that is the story of the tortoise and the hare. This story where a tortoise and a hare are in a race, and the hare gets so far ahead, gets really cocky, takes a nap, but the nap is so long that the tortoise not only catches up but passes and actually wins the race and the moral is slow and steady wins the race i cannot think about that story without picturing there's a looney tunes cartoon specifically where bugs bunny is the hare and there's a there's a tortoise that he's racing it's like i have to think about that one i always think about that whenever i talk about that story So I was surveying producer Cooper's book collection and I realized he didn't have any of these Aesop fables. And I knew that one, I was going to be doing this ancient Greece series and two, that these are like a teaching method that people use to build morality, teach morality, teach ethics to children. So I went and I bought this really nice copy from Barnes and Noble. Yes, we still have a Barnes and Noble near us and beautifully illustrated. He doesn't get to actually flip through this book. Um, This is a gift. Actually, it's a gift from you all 
to him because as you've been uh, supporting the show, I was able to take the money that goes to this show to buy this book for him. So he says thank you to you all for supporting the show. By the way, shout out to Lori for supporting the show over at Buy Me a Coffee. We'll talk more about that here at the end of the episode. The, the money that you all have been giving to the show went to buy a book for the show, but also for my son. And this was... This has been an interesting experience for us reading these stories to Cooper. Obviously, he's too young to really grasp <laughs> the morals and what's going on in these stories. So in time, you know, this won't be the one and only time I read this book to him, probably. And he may read it for himself here later on in life. But it's been an interesting exercise to go through this book and read over these stories. All of these stories, you know, I mentioned the tortoise and the hare. Just about all of these stories involve anthropomorphic animals. These animals that are alive and talking to one another. And typically, I would say, to maybe oversimplify every Aesop fable... Every story is someone trying to do some animal trying to dupe another animal and that second animal going, what do you think? I'm stupid. That's basically what (laughs) the majority of stories have been. And because of that, a lot of the morals come back to things that we as Christians would encourage to be taught to children and to our own children. Things like, do unto others as you would have done unto you. You know, a lot of those type of stories end with some type of like thinking about others, being considerate of others. A lot of the stories revolve around not getting too prideful over yourself, not thinking too highly of yourself, realizing being content is another one, uh, realizing that you do have good things in your life and being content for what those things that you have. So these are a lot of good lessons that for us as Christians, we would agree with. And uh, is just proper ethics and morals to be taught to young children. And actually, it goes beyond just being beneficial to children. When I took Jeet Kune Do, which is a martial art for those of you who may not know, uh, I was in high school at the time when I was training in it, and it was actually the ministry of a local church in my neighborhood. My instructor would end every class by reading us one of these stories. And it was really fascinating seeing just like this group of people from as young as like mm, 10 all the way to guys who were in their mid-20s, all sitting on the floor around our instructor as she read us these stories about animals interacting with each other. And she would get to the moral and you know, give her own little two cents on the moral and send us on our way. Because the martial arts are about more than you know kicking and punching. It's about morals and character development as well. But anyway, this is a lifelong teaching tool that we have at our disposal because at some point in time, it was collected by one man or possibly a group of people who have been assimilated into one person who put these stories together, collected these stories as a way to teach morality, to teach morals to other people. And I, I think, I think it's also worth uh, mentioning that these stories from Aesop also continue a trend that we have seen time and time again throughout the story of ancient Greece. Of, yeah, these are great stories to teach morals to kids, but uh, listener discretion is advised. These are there are graphic stories in here. There are stories of animals getting torn up of violence of animals eating other animals like it's these 
hunters doing things like these can get rather graphic so yeah maybe not every single one is appropriate for a five-year-old to hear but it does continue this trend that we have seen of you know things were different there in Greece and you know twice now we've keep coming back to the uh, C.S. Lewis quote of uh, modern snubbery or snobbery or whatever, however the quote goes of like, we shouldn't be too quick to judge how things were done in the past. Uh, acting like maybe we're more, uh, more intellectual, more advanced in, in, and then the ancient cultures, but it is worth pointing out like, yeah, these are really good for the most part. Uh, there is some graphicness here and it really does show that like this ancient Greece was very different from our own time period. It, there were things that are very, there are things that were just accepted as normal that nowadays doesn't even come close. And that means in a couple more hundred years, people are going to look back at this time period and go, man, I can't believe they got away with doing whatever, you know? I mean, we even, you can even look back into like, not even that long ago, you go back to like the, the thirties and forties and fifties and in movies of how, you know, how we depicted uh, African Americans in films, or, I mean, you could go all the way to the 80s when it comes to like some of the negative stereotypes that we were pushing in of Asian characters in movies like like yeah we could do a whole series on that snobbery comment from uh, C.S. Lewis but anyway yeah so why why take the time to why take the time to talk about and read a bunch of Aesop fables? Well, it's it's good light reading, that's for certain. Um, it's also just like a, as I keep coming back to, it is a good teaching tool, um, and it has been used throughout history as a way to teach things. So I would encourage you, uh, if you've got kids or you work with kids. Get some Aesop fables together. That might be a good way. You know, I could definitely see how you could use some of these stories as like sermon teaching illustrations for children and probably adults as well. I have heard before, looking at the context of the New Testament, I have heard before, I think it was from R.C. Sproul, but don't quote me on that. Uh, I think it was R.C. Sproul who said that Aesop fables are about the closest thing literary speaking wise that we have to the parables of Jesus. So you could look you could see a couple similarities right off the bat. The shortness aspect of it. Jesus has some very short parables and even some of the longer ones are still pretty short stories. You think of like um Oh, the prodigal son is probably like one of the longest parables that Jesus teaches, and it's still relatively short of a story. Uh, not only do we have the uh, the short, the brevity aspect of it, but uh, all very relatable, at least to the original audience. You know, the Aesop fables talk about the gods and the hunters and the animals that they would be familiar with similarly with the the parables of jesus jesus was very keen on using um agricultural related things that the original audience would be familiar with and um obviously references the currency that they use as well um the only major difference and this is where it's close but not quite is the fact that um while aesop fables teach the morality lessons there's obviously with the parables of jesus a deeper spiritual meaning oftentimes but much like the um much like Aesop fables, sometimes it may not be quite evident. How many times in scriptures do we have, how many times in the gospels do we have, you know, the disciples coming up to Jesus after a parable and saying, so what now? And that kind of happens a little bit with Aesop fables as well as sometimes I get to the end and I'm like, so where are we going with this? What? And when you, when the moral is presented, which usually the moral is like, 
a six word sentence it's i'm like oh yeah that makes sense and you know we see that again in the gospels where the disciples are kind of clueless on what exactly jesus is talking about when it comes to um the parable he taught so so yeah i mean the parables are a very unique literary uh literary and oral teaching method you know you hear that probably every single time you've ever heard a sermon on the parables that they are different and unique and blah, blah, blah. Um, But at least one close cousin, you could say, to the parables of Jesus are the Aesop fables. One last thing before we start to wrap up this episode, uh, at least concerning Aesop fables, is the fact that... um, is the fact that my favorite story so my favorite story that i've uh i've read so far it's a it's a real honker of a book i did not get through all of it before recording this episode i'm i've barely scratched the surface of it it's like because these stories are so short and there's so many um fables that are associated with aesop and you add in the illustrations this book is like 400 pages long and i think i've yeah having i have not gotten close to the end i'll just leave it at that but anyway uh my favorite one is this nifty little story about humans this one's got humans in it um where this guy is married to like two women uh one older one younger and the i kind of remember exactly how it goes uh the older woman doesn't like it that he has gray hair he she wants him to look youthful. So at night she plucks out all the gray hairs while his other wife who is younger doesn't want him to look too young for fear of other people like wanting him. So she plucks out all the like darker hair that's still in his hair and uh, at night to the point where between the both of them, they're the 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 guy ends up being bald because they've plucked out all of his hair as they have both tried to make him look like what they would i what their ideal would be and the moral is you can't serve two masters which is also a very good uh very good connection a very close connection to what we have in scripture you know i believe it is in the gospels where jesus talks about directly you can't serve two masters you can't serve both god and money just like having a heart divided uh, a kingdom divided against itself will not stand like we see these things presented in scripture time and time again about how um you know you can't be you can't be divided you can't you know split your devotion between two things particularly um if they demand that much out of you and they are you know they demand things out of they demand a lot out of you and if there's kind of like an expectation of how you are to live and present yourself when you're associating with that group or person whatever it may be um and obviously, like, it's hard to give your whole heart to more than one thing when it comes to devotion. You think also uh, another teaching of Jesus is the whole uh, you put your hands to the plow and you push and you don't look back because then the plow gets all wonky and doesn't like plow straight forward. Yeah, it comes up a lot in the Gospels of uh, in, in the scriptures of, yeah, can't stand divided, can you? Uh, So that is it when it comes to Aesop fables. Kind of a short one, especially compared to the last couple of episodes, but the last few have had guests on them. So it makes sense that we're back to a real short, (laughs) a real short, where where are we at right now? 20 20 something minutes. Uh, How about a real quick um, culturally relevant and my life segment before we get out of here then? So for the culturally relevant conversation, it's October now. Happy spooky month to you. Uh, for those of you who are dropping in for the first time and don't know, I am one of those horrible, rotten Christians who loves Halloween. I love spooky things. I really do. And because of that, I would like to recommend a podcast to you all. It just recently started. So this is like the best time to jump in on a new show. Yep. It's called Be Afraid. 
from it's from Christianity Today. I believe it's the same production company that did the critically acclaimed The Rise and Fall of Mars Hill Church podcast. Um, this show is hosted by a professor from Fuller Seminary. I cannot think of the man's name right off the top of my head at the moment, um, but he is he is in his area of expertise is in theology and pop culture, the intersection of theology and pop culture, which reminds me also here on the AMP Network. You should listen to my listen to systematic ecology. You're listening to my seminary life. That's what I was about to say first. But you should listen to systematic ecology, faith and pop culture. Anyway, uh, so on this show, be afraid. This is a show about exploring fear. It's about exploring fear, and it is everything I have been looking for. I've been looking for a podcast like this. I've been thinking about starting a show like this where, and I'm honestly, I'm doing something like this here in a few weeks with the debut of Monsters and Luther episode. But in each episode of Be Afraid, he's exploring the concept of fear through the lens of horror films and explicit passages of scripture and it has been so good so far i will give you a bit of a warning there is language involved there is some uh strong language from the host which is very encouraging to me to start doing over here but i won't because I just like to keep things plain and simple sometimes. But if I, yeah, you know, if as you're listening to this, if you've got space in your podcast rotation, it sounds like it's going to be a seasonal show. So uh, he was talking about like 10 episodes for this first season. So I would, I would, if you've got space or you can make space, I'd recommend that, especially since we're right now in spooky season. And who knows? Maybe if you're not really like a horror movie person, this might not make you more comfortable with the uh, genre, but maybe it will um, help you understand why people like this genre, people like myself. So that's our culturally relevant moment. And now for a very special edition of my life, I got a job. I have been hired by my local YMCA, and I swear this next part is true, to be a ninja coach for their Ninja Zone program. Ninja Zone is a very popular, growing um, program that actually started here in Indiana in Wheatfield that combines martial arts, free running, and tumbling together in a big activity environment. And for those of you who may not know, I have been training in the martial arts for 21 years actually. I have I hold the rank of black belt in several martial arts, but I've never been able to achieve a rank high enough to be able to open my own dojo. And so this is almost the most perfect ideal scenario for me with this new job because not only do I get to come into a new environment this is a newer program for my local YMCA and there's a lot of freedom in the curriculum and uh, I like the uh, I like creative freedom I'm excited for that <clears throat> but also this allows me to be able to teach the martial arts uh, to the younger generation, to the very younger generation. This starts at like, Producer Cooper is actually old enough to start training in this program, which is insane to me. Um, but also just to like, it's a few hours a week, every week. The pay is good. There's a lot of like YMCA benefits that come with this. This is like a growing community, like I said. So there's all these opportunities for growth and advancement. They hold a ninja con every year, which is again, super comic booky, right? Like that sounds like something out of a comic book. And, you know, I get to kind of make some kids dreams come true because who very few it's very few kids grow up not wanting to be a ninja at some point you know like most children at some point is like tying something around their head like a 
like a headband or like a t-shirt or something to try and do like the mask thing and you get like you know grab a plastic sword and start swinging it around like I get to help like make that happen for some kids and that's that's exciting so I'm excited for this I would appreciate prayer for those of you who are like longtime followers of the show, I would I'm I'm asking you all actually to pray because whether it's a a good change or a bad change, I have a hard time adjusting when there is change. It it as ex, I was excited to get the job, but I was also depressed the entire day when I got the job offer. I want this job. But it's just like my body does not adjust well to big changes. So I'd appreciate prayer for that. Also, just as a heads up, the last time there was a big change in my life was a year ago with the birth of producer Cooper. The problem that eventually occurred is that we had to make a major pivot. Some of you may recall started missing episodes that did the state of the podcast address episode, had to make some changes, had to make some pivots, and it worked. I'm just letting you all know now, this is going to fall under that category of this is going to be a big shift for the show. I don't know right now what's going to happen, but last time I tried to plow forward and it didn't work. So there may come a time where I have to say, hey, because of this new job, the show is going on hiatus briefly, just so that way I can kind of like figure some things out. I promise my seminary life, uh, the absolute worst case scenario is that my seminary life is going away. I don't want that to happen. I think there's still a lot of things that my seminary life needs to address and accomplish. And I know that because I have a whole list <laughs> of things that I still want to do here on the show. So this I'm not trying to scare anybody into thinking the show is going to go away. That's not, that's not the case. A brief hiatus so that way I can kind of catch my breath. That is possible. Uh, thankfully, going to start recording episodes for the next series dialogues here pretty soon. So that might help as well. But We'll see. We pivoted once. We can pivot again. So, uh, and that's it for the my life. So let's go ahead and start wrapping this episode up. Thank you all for listening. If you haven't yet already, please rate and review the show wherever you get your podcasts and consider sharing this episode with a friend who you think could maybe get something out of it. MSL is part of AMP. I think I mentioned that already. Check out a whole bunch of other great shows here on the network. Uh, you can help support the show over at buymeacoffee.com slash MSL pod. You can make a one-time donation or you can support the show on one of our support tiers. Everybody who supports the show at $9 a month gets a shout out here on the show. So shout out to you, Lori, for supporting the show. I think I've missed a couple shout outs, which is why I went ahead and shouted your name out twice in this episode. Um, So there you go. You're, we do, (laughs) I do really, I am very thankful for you and for your support. It's just that I'm forgetful. (laughs) That's why you didn't get your last few. Um, So Yes. Thank you for your patience with me. And I think that's it. Please uh, head into the description of this episode to find links for all of the important stuff. Um, Yeah. Follow the YouTube channel. I think that's it. Next week on the show, Lord willing, I guess I'll just start saying that as I transition into this new uh, job sphere. Uh, Lord willing, next week here on the show... I've been putting this one off. It's been on the books the whole time, but uh, we're going to talk politics. <laughs> we're going to get a little political on next week's episode, looking at the uh, ancient Greece with their politics, their uh, the proto-America, proto-democracy thing. That's That's what we're doing next time. But as always, this is Brandon and producer Cooper signing off, reminding you as always... Ah!